Let me ask you a question. Would you trust a miniseries made by Russian state media about the U.S. government's botched attempts to save people during Hurricane Katrina, after which 1,800 people died? If you wouldn't, why would you trust a miniseries about Chernobyl made by Comcast and Time Warner Cable? Oh, oh, I just couldn't resist making a video about this one, HBO's miniseries Chernobyl. If you haven't seen it yet, this is a spoiler alert. So I watched the whole series, and of course I expected the run-of-the-mill anti-Soviet propaganda, but there are some moments where it just gets really ridiculous. Let's start with the first episode, when all those party apparatchiks ran to the nuclear bunker for a meeting after Chernobyl blew its top. There was this wise elder who talked about the exploits of Vladimir I. Lenin and Soviet socialism that quickly turned into some sort of tirade about how people need to be told what's good for them and shouldn't be allowed to leave. I wonder how many of you know the name of this place. The Vladimir I. Lenin Nuclear Power Station. Exactly. Vladimir I. Lenin. And how proud he would be of you all tonight. Especially you, young man. And the passion you have for the people. Is that not the sole purpose of the apparatus of the state? Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we fall prey to fear. But our faith in Soviet socialism will always be rewarded. Now, the state tells us the situation here is not dangerous. Have faith, comrades. The state tells us it wants to prevent a panic. Listen well. It's true. When the people see the police, they will be afraid. But it is my experience that when the people ask questions that are not in their own best interest, they should simply be told to keep their minds on their labor and leave matters of the state to the state. We seal off the city. No one leaves. And cut the phone lines. Contain the spread of misinformation. That is how we keep the people from undermining the fruits of their own labor. Of course, that guy, his speech, and that unproductive meeting didn't really happen. It's just cheap, made-up propaganda to make communists look like a bunch of mistrustful idiots. You can even read Midnight in Chernobyl by the liberal New York Times journalist Adam Higginbotham. He describes the situation a lot differently, you know, people scrambling into action, trying to figure out what happened, trying to see how they can get water to the reactor, not just sitting around trying to see how they can cover their own asses. And there are a lot of other moments like this, like when Boris Sherbina threatens to throw Valery Legasov out of a helicopter because he won't tell him how a nuclear reactor works. How does a nuclear reactor work? What? It's a simple question. It's hardly a simple answer. Of course. You presume I'm too stupid to understand. So I'll restate. Tell me how a nuclear reactor works or I'll have one of these soldiers throw you out of the helicopter. These bits of subliminal propaganda paint a bleak picture of the Soviet Union, as if it was a country in which nobody wanted to do anything unless they had a gun to their head. God forbid people think that Soviet socialism was built by people sick and tired of living under an oppressive monarchy. Because throughout Soviet history, it was often the case that people made serious personal sacrifices out of their own free will. And there are many examples of this, like Alexei Stahanov, who mined 227 tons of coal in one shift. 
set new records in mining, and inspired others to become labor enthusiasts throughout Stalinist industrialization. You also have others like Yuri Gagarin, an avid communist throughout his whole life, and the first to brave the unknown of space. Then you had many women like Pasha and Yelena, who repeatedly exceeded quotas on her farm, organized women's tractor brigades, and became a government deputy for her hard work. Every day people went to great lengths to accomplish the feats of their time. So we're going to skip over the majority of these propaganda moments, except this one. Because this scene was by far the most ridiculous part of the entire series. Who's in charge here? I'm the crew chief. I'm Shadov, Minister of Coal Industries. We know who you are. How many men do you have? On this shift, 45 here, 100 in total. I need all 100 men to gather their equipment and get on the trucks. Do you? To where? That's classified. Come on, then. Start shooting. You haven't got enough bullets for all of us. Kill as many as you can. Whoever's left, they'll beat the living piss out of each of you. You can't talk to us like that. Shut the fuck up. This is Tula. This is our mine. We don't leave unless we know why. You're going to Chernobyl. Do you know what's happened there? We dig up coal, not bodies. The reactor fuel is going to sink into the ground and poison the water from Kiev to the Black Sea. All of it. Forever, they say. They want you to stop that from happening. How are we supposed to do that? They didn't tell me, because I don't need to know. Do you need to know, or have you heard enough? Now you look like the Minister of Coal. What you just saw was HBO's scared, effeminate Soviet Minister of Coal, Mikhail Shadov, who looks like he's never worked a day in his life. A weak man, out of touch with the workers, who brings armed soldiers out of fear that the miners he needs to dig a hole under the reactor might kill him or something. Now this is what Mr. Shadov actually looked like. He worked his whole life, born into a peasant family in 1927. First he worked on farms, then as an engineer, and in the late Soviet years he made it all the way up to the Central Committee of the Communist Party. So the guy really earned the title of Minister of Coal, and according to the real Valery Legasov, he worked alongside the miners to dig that hole, risking life and limb. The groundwater under Chernobyl nuclear power station was in a very unfortunate location, 32 meters deep. And of course, even if just a piece of nuclear fuel had fallen into the basin, it would have threatened the drinking water of a significant part of Ukraine with nuclear contamination. The likelihood of such an event was understood to be extremely low, but nevertheless, Evgeny Pavlovich Velikhov insisted that 21 concrete slabs be built under the reactor. To accomplish this, the miners very actively worked with their minister, Mikhail Shadov, who also actively and desperately worked. Shadov, the miners he brought with him, and other liquidators, as members of the cleanup crew were called, didn't have guns to their heads. There seems to be this underlying intent of the storyline to portray everyone as slaves to the Communist Party's arbitrary and secretive decisions. Legasov even voices this idea to Sherbina at one point. Maybe I, I, I've just spent too much time in my lab. Or maybe I, I'm just stupid. Is this really the way it all works? An uninformed, arbitrary decision that will cost who knows how many lies made by some apparatchik, some career party man? 
I'm a career party man. You should watch your tone, Comrade Legaza. But of course those decisions were only arbitrary in the world of HBO's Chernobyl. It ties into why they even made up the character of Ulyana Khomyuk in the first place, who was supposed to represent the many scientists that advised Legasov and Sherbina throughout the crisis. But that's just it. The Communist Party was an organizational body of the government that called nuclear scientists from across the Soviet Union to solve a nuclear problem. That's the opposite of arbitrary decision making. So why did HBO decide to exclude this minor detail? Simple. One anti-socialist scientist fits the narrative much better. The narrative that communists lie and that Soviet society is based on lies. Well, here's something HBO falsified. The military was not kept in the dark about radiation levels, as General Tarakanov says in the miniseries. The real General Tarakanov called that utter nonsense in an interview with RT. Скажите, пожалуйста, такой момент. Вы в фильме говорите о том, ну, ваш персонаж, да, который играет вас, говорит о том, что истинные цифры радиации, истинные масштаб трагедии скрывают даже от вас, от военных. Нет, нет, это он говорит ерунду, потому что я вам рассказываю. Когда на государственной комиссии, которая называлась Щербина, и там были, значит, у нас еще первый замминистр министра здравоохранения Воробьев, Самоленко, это зам главного инженера, потом был у меня в операции в штабе находился, вот. Значит, еще там пару сотрудников, я не помню даже фамилии их. И, а, они сидят все, и Самойленко на макете докладывает значит, о том, что роботы не сработались, что вот наиболее, наиболее сильные точки остались на, на крышах третьего блока, второго, первого и вокруг атомной станции. Ну, Щербина так, значит, прямо, скажу, в такое в уныние, такое угнетение. А что же делать, если роботы не сработают? Что же делать? Тогда, значит, я не помню сейчас, кто это сказал. Единственный вариант – это биороботы. Биороботы. Но я сразу понял, о чем речь о солдатах. Вот. Сразу так ну, В фильме это говорит Легас. Да, Легас. А, его не, близко не а было. Его не было там. Да. То есть в этом не да. соответствует. Но это действительно, эта фраза да. прозвучала. Да. In fact, the liquidators were nicknamed the Green Machines because of their green uniforms and because they continued their work despite exposure to unbelievably high levels of radiation that would have disabled even robots. One operator from Pripyat summed up the general attitude perfectly. Radiation was afraid of me, and I was not afraid of radiation. It's clear by the interviews with many liquidators that they heroically and willingly answered the call to save hundreds of thousands of lives. Now let's move on to another one of HBO's historical inaccuracies, that old babushka milking the cow. This is an evacuation, you understand? You have to come with me. Why? You're not the first soldier to stand here with a gun. When I was 12, the revolution came. Tsar's men, then Bolsheviks. Boys like you, marching in lines. They told us to leave. No. Then there was Stalin and his famine. The Holodomor. My parents died. Two of my sisters died. They told the rest of us to leave. No. Then the Great War. German boys, Russian boys. More soldiers, more famine, more bodies. My brothers never came home, but I stayed and I'm still here, after all that I have seen. So I should leave now, because of something I cannot see at all. No. So for one, Tsarist forces never crossed through the region where Chernobyl was located in. So how could they have asked her to leave? And number two, the concept of Holodomor, that is the highly disputed idea that Stalin deliberately starved millions of Ukrainians in the early 1930s, was only popularized by the Ukrainian diaspora by the early 1980s. Most of Holodomor's earliest proponents were members of Ukrainian nationalist militias that collaborated with the Nazis in World War II. And in typical Nazi fashion, their hatred for communists followed only second to their hatred for Jews. Two Ukrainian Quislings of Moscow, D. Shumsky and M. Khvilovi, who believed that Moscow was working for a better communist Ukraine, but eventually realized that she was only expanding her empire, 
committed suicide. They were replaced by El Kahanovich, a secretary of the Communist Party of Ukraine, and Shalehes, a Schlichter, Wairachis, among others, as assistant secretaries. All of them were Jews. The following Jews held positions in the Ministry of Police V. Belitsky, Karlsson, M. Latsis, F. Kauk, T. Fuchs. El Kahanovich realized he would have a monumental task in bringing the Ukrainian villagers to heal. They were hard-working farmers, fiercely proud of their livelihood and land, and would defend this to the death. Moscow's plan was to take all the land and reduce the villagers to virtual serfdom under the guise of collectivization. To achieve this, Kahanovich and the Politburo organized a man-made famine in which 7 million Ukrainians died. That's not to say there wasn't a famine and that many people didn't die, but it certainly was not confined only to Ukraine. It took place across the Soviet Union. And by 1986, it's unlikely that old lady would have ever even heard of what Holodomor was. But wait, what about that scene when Legasov admits to persecuting Jewish scientists? Doesn't that make the Soviet Union just as anti-Semitic as the Holodomor proponents? You were the Communist Party secretary. In that position, you limited the promotion of Jewish scientists. Yes. To curry favor with Kremlin officials. You're one of us like ourselves. No, Jews had equal rights. Just like everyone else in the Soviet Union. If he was still alive, you could have asked Yefim Slavsky, a Jewish Soviet communist who saw it all. He joined the Communist Party in 1918, fought in the Civil War and World War II. He was also one of the creators of the Soviet nuclear program, later head of Soviet nuclear production, hero of socialist labor, two-time recipient of the Stalin Prize, and member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. There's a reason Nazis considered communism to be a Jewish conspiracy, because the Soviet Union was really the only country for a while that had many Jewish government functionaries. Not to mention it was a criminal offense to discriminate against Jews in the workplace, in public, wherever. Now there's one more discrepancy we have to go over, and it's a very serious one about Valery Legasov. The series begins and ends with his suicide, and it's portrayed as if he did it because he embarrassed the party with his dissent. But he said 10 years for criminal mismanagement. What does that mean? No one knows. It doesn't matter. What does matter is that to them, Justice was done. There was nothing sane about Chernobyl. What happened there, what happened after, even the good we did, all of it, all of it. Madness. They'll deny it, of course. They always do. That's the exact opposite of the truth. Although no one knows for sure why Legasov committed suicide, the ridicule he faced from his colleagues may have played a big role. And he received that ridicule because he defended the Communist Party's official account of what happened at Chernobyl, at a time when it was fashionable to be a dissident. It's true he didn't receive the Hero of Socialist Labor Award, but that's a far cry from the HBO KGB threatening to destroy his entire future. Your testimony today will not be accepted by the state. It will not be disseminated in the press. It never happened. You will live, however long you have. But not as a scientist, not anymore. You keep your title and your office, but no duties, no authority, no friends. No one will talk to you. No one will listen to you. Other men, lesser men, will receive credit for the things you have done. Your legacy is now their legacy. You will live long enough to see that. You will not communicate with anyone about Chernobyl ever again. 
You will remain so immaterial to the world around you that when you finally do die, it will be exceedingly hard to know that you ever lived at all. So those are the major things HBO either deliberately turned into propaganda or got wrong through lack of historical research. Although it's doubtful they were mistakes because other parts of the series were selectively presented with pristine accuracy. But I'll get to that in a minute. Other more minor discrepancies include the animal shooting scenes. In reality, only trained soldiers were deployed in forests to kill irradiated animals, not clueless young boys going house by house in urban areas. The miners never took off all their clothes. A lot of people are harping on this, but I think it's just a small detail. I don't know why they decided to do that. Also, the scene with the party boss from the shoe factory really ground my gears. It was just a cheap jab at the ability of workers to govern a country by portraying the archetypal communist as a fat alcoholic who doesn't care about societal problems. But whatever, we'll gloss over those. Now, for the sake of fairness, let's go over the major things this series got right. The aesthetic is the most obvious one. Throughout the series, everything looks like it's right out of the Soviet Union. The buildings, the clothes, the interior decorating, all very cool. They paid close attention to detail with that. It's also true that the design flaws in the Soviet RBMK reactor played a role in the explosion, although it was only the unique combination of events and bypassing of safety regulations that could have allowed the situation to lead to an explosion. But let's not make the mistake in thinking that this issue was specifically tied to the Soviet system. The 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster also occurred as a result of a failure to meet basic safety standards, experiencing three nuclear meltdowns with General Electric made reactors. In 1979, the Three Mile Island disaster took place in Pennsylvania, a partial reactor meltdown that resulted from both the lack of personnel training and critical design flaws in the control room. It was a miracle there wasn't a wider disaster because the emergency response was extremely disorganized. Who knows what that would have meant if they had to face a crisis like Chernobyl. The specifics behind how the reactor exploded were on point, and the general sequence of liquidation events, like helicopters dumping sand and boron, digging the hole under the reactor, and the portrayal of radiation sickness in the hospitals. And that's part of the big takeaway, after looking closely at this miniseries. Disguising propaganda with the director's so-called creative take on historic events is a large component of artificial narratives in Western media. And it doesn't help that not much information is available in English that might lead someone to believe that the Soviet Union wasn't a hellhole. The series director, Johann Renk, said it perfectly in an interview. His task? To create the best possible film experience, even if he had to bend the truth. Well, that little harmless bending of the truth didn't only bother me. In fact, those with closer ties to the events of 1986 were much less polite than I was. 